can we bow our heads as we pray? Father, I want to thank you for that time of your presence. Thank you for the first and second teachings. Thank you for what you have done with them already. Thank you for righteousness that you have promised that will prevail in our time. Lord, today is on that time we are looking up to you that your spirit will teach us your word again. And that you bear this teaching on the wind of the Holy Ghost that will go round the earth and cause righteousness to prevail even as you have desired. We also ask, Father, that you cause men to hunger for righteousness. And we also ask that you reveal your love even in our hearts. Thank you, blessed Father. Glory be to your name. Jesus' mighty name that we have prayed. Amen. Yeah, welcome to another teaching. Uh, in the series of teachings we'll be having on the purpose of man. In the first teaching, we looked at uh, the creation of heaven and the earth, and we concluded using the scriptures that there was a word before the word of man. And that word was headed by Lucifer, and uh, he had some inhabitants with him on earth then who were spirits. And that uh, when he rebelled, God destroyed that word. And we also saw from the Bible that God promised him that he was going to humiliate him before his final destruction. And then we also saw in a, a second teaching that man was that creature that God meant when he said he was going to humiliate and disgrace Satan. And we said that God concluded that uh, was going to send man to front for him why we back up man with his nature, character, and glory. And that's what the Bible meant when it said man was created in the image and the likeness of God. We also saw from the Bible that man disappointed God and he fell. And uh, when God was creating that man, we saw in the Bible that two things were paramount to God. One was his righteousness. And that we looked at the Bible and we saw that God is obsessed with righteousness. And the second thing God considered was that he was going to humiliate the devil. And because of that humiliation of the devil, a lot of things were also considered in deciding what man was going to look like. Now, one of those things was procreation. Because the first word of Lucifer, they were not procreating. They were spirits, they don't procreate. And then God destroyed them because of some limitations he saw in them. Now, I want to look at why did God decide that this word of man, that will be procreation. If we look at heaven typically, and also in our first teaching, we said that uh, when God was going to create the word of Lucifer, he decided he was going to replicate the structure of heaven on earth or in the world of that time. And that structure was having a held, then the subjects, and culture, the culture of righteousness. So when God was creating the first world, he had Lucifer as the head, just as God is the head of the kingdom of heaven. Then he had the inhabitants of the head who were spirits, well, I subject to him who didn't have access directly to God, unlike Lucifer, who had access to God. Just as God in heaven have angels under him as subjects. And we realized that in that government, when Lucifer uh, rebelled in heaven and he was pushed or driven back to the earth, because he was the one ruling over the creatures, of the earth then. It was very easy for him to corrupt them. It was corrupting that heart that caused God to destroy it completely. And also we saw in the book of uh, Second King chapter 4 verse 4 that God called uh, Lucifer the God of this world. So everything we concluded then, we picked them from the scripture. That it was the sole God of the world of that time before God destroyed 
that civilization. Now, if you look at that uh, kind of government, you realize that um, it was very easy for Satan to corrupt those on earth because they had no access to God and they were not at the same level with him. He was the only one who was relating with God. He was the head. He was the God of that generation. Now, so when God decided that I was going to bring another world after the destruction of Lucifer and that civilization, he now considered the second system of government that rules in heaven. The second system of government that rules in heaven is a system of equality. Don't forget I said the first system of government is that of a head, then subjects. The second, that's the one that existed between God and the angels, God being the head. Now, the second system is that of equality. That's the government between the Trinity itself, between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's see what the Bible says about the kind of uh, relationship they have. Now, turn with me to the book of John chapter 10, we read verse 30. John 10, 30. John 10, we read verse 30. And I read, it says, I and my father are one. Jesus is one speaking here, that him, Jesus, and the father are one. Let's see another one in First John chapter 5. Let's see verse 7 of it. And the Bible is saying in verse 7 of 1 John chapter 5 that for three, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Talking about equality. The two passages we are read is talking about three kinds of people in heaven who are one. They relate as one. They relate as having equal value because the Bible told us that Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So they are of equal value. None is greater than the other. Everything that makes the Father is everything that makes the Son. Everything that makes the Son is everything that makes the Holy Spirit. So there's equality before, between them. Though they still have a held. We're not going to that now. But we know there's equality from what we have read here. So, God decided to pattern this new world of man after that kind of relationship. Let's see that in um, um, Genesis chapter 5, from verse 1 to 3. Genesis 5, from 1 to 3. And I read, this is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created Adam, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness and image and called his name Seth. Now, if you look at verse 2 of what we read, it said, He created them, male and female, and called their name Adam. That's to say, He called Eve Adam, He called Adam Adam. Many they are equal, meaning they are the same. Even though they may have different responsibilities, as one is to be a help me to the other, but in value. So both of them were called Adam, regardless of the fact that one is female and one is male. That's to say, there's no difference between a man and a woman in value, though there might be difference in responsibility. Anywhere you have two people or three people, even an organization, there must be a leader. If not, there will be chaos. To avoid chaos, there must be a leader or a head. But when it comes to value, they are the same. That's what that place is telling us. And in verse 3 also, he said, they brought forth children after their own likeness and their image. He didn't say they brought forth, they had to bring forth children in a lesser likeness or image. That means their children will look exactly like them, having the same value like them. What's God trying to say here? He's trying to bring equality among humanity. That no man 
is greater than the other. No matter the responsibility that's ascribed to them as individuals. When it comes to value, man is man. Man and woman are the same. Every man is not different from the other man. It does not matter the stature. It does not matter the, the wisdom. It does not matter whatever but, uh, 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 advantage the other one has over the other. But the truth is that they were created to be of the same value. That's other place uh, is telling us. It means when we are treating men, we must treat them as equal to us. Regardless of the position God has put us. Regardless of the place of authority or leadership God has put us. Even though God the Father is the leader in heaven, yet Jesus said they are the same. Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. They relate as one. Human beings should relate as one. Equality. Nobody, nobody should be deified. Nobody. Nobody should be worshipped. And nobody should demand worship from the other. Because we are the same. In creation, God created us to be the same. So, paraventure you are walking in a place and God has lifted you up. And people want to worship you. You should refuse it as a Christian. Or you too, uh, maybe some people are in your place of work, above you or whatever, in responsibility or in place of leadership. They are not to be worshipped. They are human beings of the same likeness and image like you are. We all pray for Madam, and that place where I say we are of the same likeness and image. No difference at all. So our position does not matter. Our social status does not matter. Our place in society does not matter. The truth is that we are the same. A woman being must be treated the same. Let's see what Jesus told us again or taught us in the book of Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. Let's see from 16. He said, Then said he unto him, that's Jesus now, talking unto someone, a parable. He said, A certain man made a great supper and bid many, and said his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidding, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, Have bought a piece of ground, I must need go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, Have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 20. And another said, Have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his lord distance. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in either the poor, the maim, the hurt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou art commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. 24, the last verse. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now this is uh, a story God told um, some people during a feast. If you go to the preceding verses, you see that it was a feast they were having there. And Jesus was trying to talk to them on how we should organize our feast. And he gave uh, a story about a man who was having a banquet for dignified people like him. Unfortunately, those people began to give excuses. And the man now said, why? Go to the street and bring people for me. And the Bible told us the kind of people they brought from the street. He said they were maimed. He said they were blind people. He said they were hot. And um, they are strangers because definitely this man, uh, this man doesn't know them. So definitely they are strangers. So they went to the street and brought all manners of people. Don't forget he had prepared seats for those he was expecting, those dignified people, those senators, those presidents, those business tycoons like himself who refused to come. And that means when they brought in these people who were lamed, the disabled people, these people were strangers, these people were poor, they came and sat on the same seat prepared for those people who were dignified. 
The food that you have prepared for them was the same food that they served these people. The servant possibly that has prepared to serve those his friends were the same servant that served these blind, these hot, these poor people, these strangers. What was Jesus trying to tell us? Don't forget also the ambience, the environment was the same. Maybe AC, the environment, and all manners of things there. Now, Bible didn't tell us that it changed the venue. Bible didn't tell us it changed the sitting arrangement. Bible didn't tell us it changed anything that I prepared for those people. The same thing he prepared for those dignified people were the same things that he brought these people to come and enjoy. Jesus was trying to pass a, 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 a teaching to those people there in the feast that human beings are the same and must be given equal treatment regardless of their status, regardless of who they are, that we are all the same as human beings, the same value, and that even those people who are disabled must be treated the same way like people who are not disabled. Jesus is trying to bring a pattern here that for no reason should a man be so high that he cannot be seen with others who are not as high as himself. Or no reason should a man look down on other men. Or no reason should there be a place that others can go to that others can, some other people cannot go to. Or no reason that some men should be accorded some kind of honor and respect that others cannot be accorded the same respect and honor. He was saying that the kind of courtesy you extend to one is the same kind of courtesy you may extend to other. The honor you give to one is the kind of honor that you must give to another. That human beings are the same because I created them the same. That's what Jesus was trying to pass across here. And that nobody, nobody should be so high among men and see himself to be better than the other. Whatever you are is just a responsibility that God has given to you a place of leadership. Just like the Father coordinates the activities of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, I say here also, that regardless of race, regardless of nationality, regardless of religion, is when we came to earth here that we decided which religion are you going to go, which religion am I going to follow, I follow my father's religion, I change my religion, all of that. It's when we came to the earth that we know that God said we should come through this lineage, we should come through this, uh, this, uh, uh, this nation, all of that. But the truth is that we didn't decide where we're going to come from. We wouldn't decide the kind of religion that our parents were going to be doing when we come to the earth. So God said, regardless of those things, we are all the same. So because you're a Christian does not mean when you see a Muslim, you should treat him in a way different from the way you treat other Christians. Because he's a woman being like you are. Don't forget when God was making reference in that Genesis chapter 5, when he said he called them Adam. They were already fallen then. They were already They've already come short of the glory of God. So it does not matter whether that man is a Christian. It does not matter whether that man is a Muslim. It does not matter whether that man is a black man. It does not matter whether that man is a white man. It does not matter whether that man is colored. We are all the same in value. And our treatment must be the same as human beings. Now, I remember a story of uh, sometimes 2010. I had a dream. And I saw myself going everywhere with the president of America then, Obama. Going to the same places to play, you know, all of that, going around town, everywhere. We lay down the same day and we slept. So when I woke up, I was wondering the meaning of that dream. And God said, two minutes. One was that the poor and the rich will lie together. And that's the kind of, the, the kind of war he created. So you can imagine ordinary me coming to lie on the same bed with Obama. Imagine that kind of dream that God brought for me to give me the kind, to give me the understanding of the kind of what he created myself to Obama. The gap is too wide. And yet God is saying here that whether you're Obama and me, that were the same before him. So treat man with courtesy. Treat your neighbor with dignity. Treat your neighbor with honor, regardless of who they are. Treat them in a way that you want to be treated as a woman being. Now, again, let's look at um, 
the relationship that should exist between believers too. Because we see in our generation today, you see how men of God carry themselves, how people worship men of God, because they don't understand what God expected us to do as human beings. Let's see um, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heir with Christ, it so be that we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. Paul was talking about us being joint heir with Jesus Christ here. You can imagine Cornelius and Jesus the same. Because Jesus came as a woman being. When he came to the earth here, he lived as a woman being. He went through everything that any other woman being would go through. And so, he was practically a woman being here. Though he was a woman and God, but the woman side of him, Paul was telling us that we are the same with him. That is our senior brother. That we are co here with him. That's what the Bible is saying. Let's see another passage in um, Hebrew chapter 2. Hebrew 2. Eleven and twelve. He say, For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Jesus was John speaking here that he will declare the name of God unto his brethren, calling us brethren. Do you see men of God today calling you brethren? No, it's not likely. They would rather call you my son. Yeah, well, I'm not saying it's wrong to call them their son, but they are quick to give you the impression that you are lower than them. No man is higher than the other. No man is lower than the other. No man is greater than the other. We might have different responsibilities to fulfill for God. That's the difference. The different, different responsibilities, just like Adam and Eve. Yeah, God called both of them Adam. So, God might have endowed you with, with some uh, power, with some anointing for the purpose he wants to carry out on it in our time. He said he sent his word to Jacob. He landed upon Israel. So it was because of Israel that God gave his word to Jacob. So because all God wants to achieve on it in our time, he could give you anointing bigger than other people. That does not make you of higher value than they are. Because at the beginning, the Bible said, bring forth after the same likeness and image, the same thing. And that Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, said, we are his brethren. None is lesser than the other. That's what Jesus is saying here. And let's see how the uh, first supposed to play that out. Let's see the book of Acts chapter 10. Let's see how they acted that out. At Apostles chapter 10, we're going to read them um, 25 and 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Now, this is Cornelius, a centurion, who was not even born again. And they told him to send for Peter. And Peter was coming to meet him. And when Peter got there, of course, the normal thing any woman be want to do is to worship him. So the man went down to worship him. To worship him. And Peter quickly uh, said, don't worship me. He said, I'm a man like you are. I'm of the same image, the same likeness like you are. I might be an apostle. I might have some anointment that you are. It's a responsibility given to me for the purpose that God wants to achieve. It does not make me better than you are in any way. It does not make me of higher humanity than you are. It does not make you of lower than I am. That's what Peter was saying here. And don't forget, people didn't pretend as if he was not seeing him. He quickly told him, don't do that, don't do that. So even if people are giving us that kind of treatment of a deity, we have to tell the people, no, don't do that to us. We are human beings like you are. We also saw that in Paul, experience of Paul and Barnabas in chapter 14 of Acts, when people wanted to sacrifice to them, they ran. Say, no, 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 don't do this to us. We are human beings like you are. Or no account, she will be so high 
Should we so anointed to think we are better than any other human being or we have greater image and greater likeness than they are? Because the Bible said we are created of the same image and likeness. Equality here. On no account should people should we allow people to worship us? Or on no account should we allow people to make or play God or should we play God to people? Or people to teach us as if we are gods. We are all equal before God. If Jesus will call their brethren, how much more we between ourselves? In fact, when I was a younger Christian, I used to wonder, when I read places like that, where Jesus would call human being, co heir brethren, and somebody, I read the book, then they said, Jesus Christ is our sinner brother. I said, wow, sinner brother? But that is the truth. So, if Jesus could accept, if we call him our sinner brother, how much more men of God should bring the same law before others? In fact, the treatment God taught us in the book of Luke chapter 13 is that even the higher should be the minister. He should be the one that is more humble than others. That's why Jesus washed their feet. He said, do this that I'm doing to you. Wash the feet of people who are not as great as you are. If we must practice Christianity the right way and allow the righteousness of God to prevent our time, we must stop this attitude of deifying human beings. We must stop people from worshipping us. Even if people don't know this truth, we must tell them this is the truth. Just like Peter said, this is the truth. I'm not a God. I'm a human being like you are. It's only when we do that, that we begin to see the power of God like we have never seen before. God has promised that in this generation, there's going to do mighty things. There are things I know that I cannot utter with my mouth because people will feel, no, 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 you are exaggerating. But God is said to do mighty things, not only in our lives as Christians, if we're in our nations. God will not do those things if we continue the way we are practicing Christianity. Because the way we practice Christianity is completely different from what God is expecting from us. Let us go back to the religion that was given to us at the beginning, where everybody was the same, where everybody was treated equally, where there was no one that was higher than the other, where even Jesus could not be identified among the people. They needed a guy to point out Jesus in the midst of the, of the apostles. Today you agree with me that the easiest thing to do in our churches is to point out the leader of the, of the church because he's got to see it on a great, I mean, on a uh, more dignified seat than others. But that was not the case with Jesus. That's why they needed Judas. No other reason. Because it was impossible to differentiate Jesus from the other apostles. We must return to this Christianity that was handed over to us. Now, if you look at why Satan failed, you realize it was because he did not understand God. He thought he had sufficient power to wrestle the kingdom from the Lord and became autonomous. You know, when you relate with God sometimes, there are a lot of things you will not understand about him. In fact, there are times you think he's not as powerful as you think. That was the problem they had. He thought he could have his way around God. Why did Adam fall too? Adam did not understand who he was. Satan deceived him, said he would be God. When already God was living in him, he was already God, small God here. Because the dimension of God is not fullness of God. That's why we are small God, not complete God. Except Jesus who carried the fullness of God. So, he was already God. Which God was he going to be? Because he didn't understand who he was. What are we saying here? What made both to fall, Satan and Adam, was knowledge. Knowledge of God and knowledge of self. That is why any human being that will succeed must have these two knowledge. Knowledge of self, knowledge of God. And possibly knowledge of the enemy. And if you look at the Bible in the book of John chapter 17 verse 3, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, this is eternal life. He said that you know the only true God and Jesus Christ, his son, who he has sent. That's what we call salvation. That you know him. 
So our business as Christians is to be learning and learning and learning about God and learning and learning about Jesus Christ. And don't forget that they say to know the only true God, many there are fake gods. You must be able to know too about fake gods. You must be able to learn about Satan. In Jeremiah chapter 23, the Bible said, the mighty should not glory in his might. The rich should not glory in his riches. And um, the strong should not glory in his strength. We should grow in this one thing, that we know the Lord. So the knowledge of God is what we're here for. Of course, what we, what we are here for is to institute righteousness on earth by which we are humiliating the devil, giving us the right to judge angels on the last day. But instituting righteousness means true knowledge. Without knowledge, we cannot succeed. Do you know it was because of knowledge that Jesus succeeded and Satan failed? He asked him if you are the son of God. Jesus said, I don't need to prove anything to you. I'm a son of God. I won't yield to you. He knew he was. Satan thought by killing God, he was going to silence our redeemer. He didn't know it was by killing God that we were going to be redeemed. It boils down to knowledge. Even when Jesus cried in the book of Luke, he said he cried because the people didn't know the day of their visitation. Knowledge. We cannot be good Christians without adequate knowledge of God, adequate knowledge about ourselves, adequate knowledge of the enemy. That is why as a Christian, you don't read your Bible regularly. You don't seek to learn about God. It's a matter of time you are going to be defeated like the devil. And when you are defeated, you are blaspheming. You are giving the devil the right to blaspheme God. You are not allowing the purpose of creation to be fulfilled through you, which is... Righteousness, humiliation of the devil. Knowledge. We must strive for knowledge. In summary today, we have concluded that God put a few things into consideration when he wanted to create who will come to the earth to humiliate the devil for him and to institutionalize righteousness. And we said God concluded that man, that person was going to be human and his name would be Adam. And Adam was going to be supported by God through being having the likeness and the uh, image of God. And that uh, man, the, 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 the image of God, which is his nature and his character, is in his spirit and that when man gives that spirit expression it will be fulfilling the purpose of creation and that when man does not it will be allowing the devil to blaspheme god and that likeness of god will be acquired fully through our daily and continual relationship with god And that through that, God will be able to actualize the purpose of creation, which is to institutionalize righteousness and to help him to humiliate the devil who disappointed him when he created the first world. We're going to stop there today. But before we eventually conclude, I want us to look at a few misconceptions about the creation of man and Genesis chapter 1, which we have been looking at. One, some people claim that why Satan fell, I mean, sorry, why Adam fell was because Adam and Eve made love in the Garden of Eden. That cannot be true. It cannot be true because human beings were already created for procreation. Even though in the Garden of Eden, they didn't make love, they couldn't make love. Why? Garden of Eden it was a place of intersection between the heaven and the an interface where God used to come to uh, to meet with man. It was not a physical place. That's why up to today, no archaeology has been able to discover it. So in the spirit, they don't make love. They wouldn't have made love. That couldn't have been a problem. Two, some people also claim 
um, Satan made love or the serpent made love to Eve and the product of that was Cain that killed the brother Abel. That is far from the truth. Why? We have told us that Satan has or had a body when he was living on the earth that allowed him to live on it. But when the flood came, their bodies, all the spirits, including Satan, their bodies were destroyed and they could no, no, no longer function on earth except they find a terrestrial body. That's why today no demon can operate except they find a terrestrial body in man, in animal, in birds, in, in fishes, or even in trees. They live in trees too. But they cannot pray without staying in a terrestrial body. That was why when the devil wanted to assess the garden of Eden, he couldn't go himself to assess that place except he went with one of the creatures that God made and that was serpent who offered himself. And we know that the serpent they are talking about there is the real serpent, not uh, one imaginary serpent. The serpent we know does not have male organ. It doesn't. We know serpent. So there's no way serpent will have made love to Eve. Maybe if it had been animal that another animal like a dog will have said maybe that was possible, but serpent, we have never heard about the, the male organ of, uh, of serpent. So it couldn't have been making love. Then two, the fall of man was hinging on Adam, not on Eve. Because the authority was on Adam as a man of, 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 um, of sorry, as the, the head of the home. If you remember that story, when Eve ate the fruit, their eye or her eye didn't open. It was when Adam ate it that the eyes of the people opened. Do you know if Adam had refused to eat that, that fruit, nothing would have happened? God wouldn't have driven them out because it was the authority. That's how so much authority that vested on man in a family. Now, if the problem was making love to Eve, what then was Adam's offense? What was Adam's offense? Because at least, they were all, are we saying Adam, two, three of them made love? So if, was, if that sinned, Adam didn't sin, God wouldn't have driven them out. So what are we trying to say? The problem was not about making love to serpent. Again, they said um, another theme is conception is that man handed over the earth to Adam. That's not true. We always said that because God has hidden some of this truth from us until now that there was a world before us that was ruled by serpent, I mean by the devil. And that before he fell, that world belonged to him. And that when he fell, God didn't drive him out of the earth. He only destroyed their bodies, him and the, 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 the inhabitants, that the spirits. And they are still here with us because God said he was going to humiliate them before he will finally judge them and destroy them. So when God gave Adam, when God created Adam, what he did was to say, Adam, I've created you, let me deal with them. He didn't give man the world. He gave man the art. What's the implication of that? You have a house. You want to give it to your son. People are living there. These people are all manners or riotous people who live one kind of funny life within the house. And you now tell your son, this is the document of your house. I give it to you. It's now yours. The owners will be on the man to go and flush out those people inhabiting that house so that everything about that will become his. If the man has the document and those people are still living there, he has not completely acquired that house. So, so that's what happened. God gave us the art. We were to flush out the things that were there. He didn't give us the word. We we're not the one that handed over the word to the devil. They were already had the word before we came. Let's back up that with the Bible. In John chapter 12, verse 31, and 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we see that. John 12, 31, let's quickly look at that. Uh, 
John 12, 31. It says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Here, there. Now is the judgment. Did he say there was judgment of the world before now? He said, Now, Jesus talking, is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world. Satan is the prince of the world, be cast out. There was no, you will never see anywhere in the Bible where the Bible says, Man owned the world. Mm. Mm. First Corinthians 4 4. First, I mean, sorry, Second Corinthians 4 4. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians 4 4. It says, In whom they call God of this world are blinded their minds. Of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You have seen that. The God of this world is the devil. There was never a time human being was the God of the world. And there is no Bible reference for that. So, when people say uh, Satan went to Jesus, he said, this place, has been, the word has been delivered to me, I'll give it to you. They now claim that man was the one that gave it to the devil. It's not true. There's no reference for that. The devil has always been the owner of the world. The art, the, 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 the solid structure was what was given to man. For man to flush out what was there so that what was there becomes his. The resources, everything becomes his after he has flushed out what was there. We're not the one that delivered the world to the devil. It's a misunderstanding of the scripture. Again, um, okay, let, let us back up that again with another scripture. Deuteronomy 2, 24 to 26. We want to see the character of God. You know, you can use the character of God to determine how God behaves. What he has done before, what he's doing now, what he will still do. You can use to determine the reasoning of God. Now, let's see Deuteronomy 2, 24 and 25. God speaking to Israelite here. Remember, he told the Israelite he was going to give them the land. When they go to the land of promise, he told them he has given them. Let's see what God said when he said he has given them. He said, rise up, rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Anom. Behold, I have given into thy hand Sion, the Amorite, king of Eshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it, and contend with him in battle. He is saying he has given them land. He's still telling them to contend for it in battle. What he's saying is the authority, the power, everything, every resource, resource that you need, everything, uh, tool that you're going to need to succeed have made it available to you. You only just to go and do a walkover job. But without you going to do a walkover job, that is not given to you. Yet, he told them he has given them. The same way, when God said he has given us the earth, it's not uh, the word. It was our job to go and flush out people in the world, then we take it over. And uh, when we look at subsequent teachings, we look at some misconception of Christians where somebody will say, When you were saved, all the causes are broken just because you were saved. It's not in the character of God. His character is to tell you, has given you something, you go and fight for it. The only one he gave to us freely was our salvation. Every other thing, you contend for it. He says, since the time of John, the kingdom of God has suffered violence and violence take it by force. That's why every Christian is not rich, even though God has given us riches. That's why every Christian is not living a um, heady life, even though God has given us heart. Because you must contend for it. So if there's a cause on your lineage, before you were saved, you will need to contend and destroy that cause. But today, that's not our teaching. He said, man is created to praise God. There is this misconception also, very popular, that man was created to praise God. I'll be able to uh, make us see why man was created. That there was a world, devil misbehaved, God destroyed that world, God made a promise, he was going to humiliate him, after which he will destroy him. And he was going to also use whatever he was going to create to judge them. That's part of the humiliation. And um, he wanted righteousness to uh, prevail completely on the earth. And we also saw that when God said, I create man in my image and likeness, 
we have to acquire the glory as we relate with him. So, when a Christian who is walking in the Lord is expected, one of the things expected to do is to come on with God from time to time, relate with God from time to time, through the scripture, through uh, prayers, by that, you are acquiring the likeness which is the image, I mean, which is the glory of God. So, in that your communion with God, the fellowship with God, is praise. So, praise is just one of the things you do to commune with God to, so that you can enter fullness to the glory of God. That's not why we're created. A misconception of this is why people get born again. And they, they think that was the end of, the, of everything. They just get born again, the next thing, live your life the way you like, and you go to heaven. No. You're being born again to so start the work itself. Humiliate the devil and make sure righteousness is everywhere you are. It's just the beginning. So praising God is just part of those things you do to acquire sufficient power and energy or, and, and strength and, uh, and, and, and wisdom to humiliate the devil for God and to put righteousness everywhere you are. Praise is one of the things we do. Just like you have your children at home. When you give back to them, you have not given back to them so that they can do domestic chore for you. But they will do that as part of the things that is expected of them. But you won't say the reason why you give back to them is to do domestic chores. If you are doing that to them, if you tell them that, definitely they won't read their books. They will just work hard at home and refuse to read their books. So the same way we say we are here to praise God, you see people winning souls, winning souls everywhere, and the souls that are winning are just destroy everything God has done, that the one that is the most wicked, treating men, men anyhow, racism everywhere, corruption everywhere, and yet we call ourselves Christians. Because we have been taught that it's all about praising God, we can do what we like, and yet God is pleased with us. Now let's see other misconceptions. Now, here I said, um, uh, many of tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil. I said, it's a test of obedience because there's a misconception here too where so many people, this thing has been for, for, for maybe decades, I've read books, and they will tell you the life of God is in the tree of life. No, that's not true. That's not true. We have no reference for that. But we're going to look at the Bible passages to conclude that there was never a time God told us his life was in a tree. Because God is not a tree. Why the knowledge of tree of good or evil are there? Another point we want to prove is to prove to us that those three were not the problem in themselves. They were just symbols of who to follow. Those things were a symbol of whether you are going to follow God or follow the devil. The Bible says when there is no law, there is no sin. So God needed to put something there to stand for who you will follow. Those things in themselves were not the problem. Let's see the Bible. They were just to test our obedience. Now, the Bible says that... Um, In 1 Corinthians 8.8, 8. let's see 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. 1 Corinthians 8.8, they want to prove that those trees were just symbols that were put there and they were not actually the problem in themselves. They were to help God to judge who we were going to follow and that the life of God was not in a tree because God is not a tree. Um, sorry, we said we are going to where? 1 Corinthians, sorry. 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. First Corinthians 8 verse 8. Now let's read it. He said, But meat commended us not to God, for neither if we eat are we better, neither if we eat not are we worse. This is the Bible. That there is no way meat, food, anything we take in, will commend us to God. He said, If you eat, it doesn't have any relevance. We don't eat, it doesn't have any relevance. Hmm. And we know that God cannot contradict his word. This is what telling us that food is not about God. Of course, we fast also that we can deny our spirit and some other things. But whether we eat or not, it doesn't in any way add to us. It doesn't in any way reduce anything from us. So there's no way God will violate his word. When he says meat 
food, anything we eat, has nothing to do with our spirituality. He will now go and put his life in a tree. Because putting his life in a tree, that's the tree of life, means tree has something to do with our spirituality. Again, let's see Matthew 15. To buttress that again, Matthew 15, I think verse 11. It says, not that, not that which goes into the mouth defileth a man, but that which come out of the mouth, this that defileth a man. This is Jesus speaking here. That whatever goes into the mouth does not defile a man. It's what comes after the mouth. So, eating tree of life does not in any way defile or commend us to God. The tree of life does not have the life of God in it. Because this has stayed with us for long, believing that the life of God is in the tree of life. Let's see other things that we can use to buttress our point. Okay, I say here, John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, John 5, 24. Let's see what our place is saying. In John 5, 24. John 5, 24. God is said to do great things in our time. We must walk with sound doctrine according to what he has said for us to sustain the revival that is coming. Some of these little, little things we make mistake about, devil capitalizes on them to, to, to cause havoc. For instance, we know in South Africa where people will be eating grasses for whatever. Because when you say the life of God is in a tree, then it becomes very easy for somebody to tell people to be eating grasses. Every mistake we make, devil has a way of capitalizing on it. That's why our teaching must be sound. God has particularly said that revival is coming. Great things will happen in this generation, but there must be sound doctrine. Without which, we lose it. It will not stay with us for long. Devil will find loopholes around it and truncate the plan of God. So my prayer is you and I will not be the reason why God would, I mean why devil will truncate the plan of God. We are looking at John chapter 5, verse 26. He said, For as the Father had life in him, so had he given the Son to have life in him. As God the Father had life in him, he gave Jesus to have life in him. So the life of God is in him, is not by eating tree in heaven. So he gave God Jesus Christ, his spirit, Christ the Spirit of Christ in Jesus to have life in him. We never read anywhere that Jesus became God by eating a tree. He became God by the Spirit that was in him. The life of God is in his Spirit. You see here, the Father has life, he gives some life. That life is in his Spirit. It's not in tree. Then again, Man was made from outside to host God. We must get this very clearly. When God set out to make man, I've told us that he wanted to partner with us to be able to humiliate the devil so that we can acquire his righteousness, we can acquire his character, his nature, his power, so that it becomes very easy for us to humiliate the devil. He was the one that wanted to live. He couldn't live for reasons that advanced before. So he used us as fun for himself to live. From the outset, he had put a spirit in man. For those of us who are conversant with the structure of man, we said man has a spirit. In his spirit, is the spirit is divided into three compartments. We said one is the conscience, two is uh, the intuition, then the third one is called fellowship. Some people call it communion. That fellowship or communion is where God's spirit lives. That was created from Adam time. It was not when God created, the, when Jesus came, that he began to put communion inside man. That's not true. It's not in the Bible. We will see that even before Jesus came, people carried that spirit in them. Immediately Adam sinned, and God said he became dead. Deadness means the spirit that was then departed from him. That's the meaning of the deadness there. God was no longer related with him. The spirit living inside him departed from him. But God knew that he still needed to relay with man. He will put that same spirit in his prophet those days. 
but not in everybody, unlike when Jesus came. He will put his spirit in prophet. Let's see it, that even before Jesus came, people have been carrying spirit of God inside them. It was not until Jesus came. So coming of Jesus is not what created in us a place for God to stay. It has been since creation. Let's see the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 30. Nehemiah 9 30. Nehemiah 9 30. You see here that yet many years didst thou forbear them and testify against them by the spirit in thy prophets. Mark that. By the spirit in thy prophet. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore givest thou them into the hand of the people of the land. He said, by the Spirit in thy prophet, the prophet of God of old, carried the Spirit of God in them. The Spirit of God had always been a man from the outset, from the days of Adam, not in tree. The nature of man is in his spirit, not in a tree. God is not a tree. He wouldn't have put his spirit in a tree, in tree of life. The tree of life was not to symbolize his life because they call it the spirit of life. The life of God is in the spirit. Adam carried the spirit of God. He lost that spirit when he sinned. Let's see another, another passage in, um, in um, uh, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. We'll see that there too. It's good we clarify this thing because I know one very great man of God around 1920 taught that and we began to run with that, that the spirit of God was in the tree. 1 Peter 1. 10 and 13, 10 and 11, of which salvation the prophet have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time, the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. This prophet had the spirit of Christ already living in them in Old Testament. The difference today is that it's not only a prophet he lives, he lives in everybody who has given his life to Christ. But in the in Old Testament, the Spirit of God was living in prophets. What are we trying to say? That the Spirit of God has the living man from the time of Adam. It's only when you are not doing uh, on the side of God that the Spirit leaves you. The Spirit of God is what signifies the nature and the character of God. God carries his life in his spirit. He does not carry his life in a tree because God is not a tree. Now, I say tree of life is basically for the body. Let's see Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. Genesis 3, 22 to 24. Genesis 3, 22 to 24. We see what the tree is for. They're just for to signify um, whatever, 3, 22. It says, and the Lord said, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Don't forget, at this time, God is speaking here. Man had already fallen. It was not, um, he had already, God had already been angry with him. He had even driven out of the garden. But after he drove him out of the garden, he was saying here, we need to do something to the tree of life that's in the garden. Because this man can go back there. Let's see why he wanted to seal up that place. Verse 23. Therefore, the Lord said, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the, the ground from whence it was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the garden of Eden uh, cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Don't forget verse 32, he said, Behold, the man is become one of us to know good and evil, and now least he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. The tree of life is for life in the body. The tree of life is to give man life in his body, to be able to live forever. It's to nourish his body just as food nourishes us today. Food is not meant to do anything to our spirit, but to our body. Tree of life is like food. It's food. There's nowhere food has been for the spirit, but for the physical body. So the physical body of man, if it was going to live forever, was going to be 
uh, eating the tree of uh, life. Let's also see another place in the book of Revelation, chapter uh, 22, verse 2. In the midst of the street, street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bear twelve manners of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It's talking about the tree of life here, that we still find it in heaven. After the Spirit of God, after we have been resurrected, the Spirit of God already living in us, we still need the tree of life. He's saying it here. What? For our bodies. I think that's self-explanatory. Now, if you Google the tree of life, you find other passages that talked about it in the Bible. If you go and look at those passages, you discover that none of them ever talked about the tree of life have anything to do with human spirit or that is carrying the nature of God. We can see Proverbs 3.18. It talked about tree of life. Proverbs 3.18. Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 15.4, Proverbs 15.4, Proverbs 13.12, Proverbs 13.12, Revelation 2.7, Revelation 2.7, and Revelation 22.14. All of them talked about tree of life. None of them said it carries the nature of God or the life of God in it. Why are we doing this teaching? God specifically told me that there's going to be revival. And our whole key's revival is lack of sound doctrine. And that has taken his time over the years to give me and to teach me and make me see so many things, sound doctrine, that he wants me to begin to teach those things that, that has taught me in the secret before he can bring the revival. Why am I telling you this? You will do me a favor by sharing or first of all by subscribing to this YouTube and their Facebook channel so that when we upload fresh teaching, you can be a partaker. Then you will share it. The more the people we are, the more God is, is having his way among humanity. The more people are hearing this, the more we overcome all the heresies around us today and all that the devil has corrupted so that we can bring the righteousness of God to prevail in our time. So please subscribe share and like because the more you like too the more people will watch it god bless you as you do that a lot of things are waiting for us uh, as the revival comes i don't want to talk on that now when the time comes we we'll look at the full plan of god for our time before we pray i want to ask paraventure as we're talking the spirit of god spoke to you that you are not even born again and you don't have Christ in your life and you want to give your life to Christ, can you bow down your heads so that today you begin to fulfill the purpose for which you were created? I've said that God wanted to live, not you. That's why he brought you because he couldn't do it by himself. He now brought you to come and front for him. So you're only useful to the extent to which you are a front for God. The day you stop fronting for him, you are no longer useful. That, that means no point creating you. But today, if you have accepted that you want to be a front for Jesus, front for righteousness, front for subduing the devil, disgracing him, I want to pray with you. Or paraventure, you have been taught to that God has counseled saying, God, God does not like uh, 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 righteousness again. God now loves unrighteousness because that's the meaning to me. You have been taught that, that uh, once you are saved, you are forever saved. You can be sleeping with a woman if you are a man. You can live your life carelessly. You can even sleep with an animal. You can even keep people. Sin has been cancelled. And you have listened to this teaching and it has touched your heart. And you want me to pray with you too. Can we bow down our heads as we pray? Thank you. Father, I want to thank you for the teaching today and give you praise for these ones who have uh, signified to turn a new leaf and give their life to you 
a pursuance of righteousness and the humiliation of the devil. I ask that Father, by the power in the blood of Jesus, you cleanse their sin, you accept them by reason of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Let their sins be blotted out. And let that grace that's in Jesus be made available to them to overcome sin, that they may live righteous life. May them agents of change that they are trying to raise for this generation so that righteousness can fill the heart again. And Father, I pray for everyone who has um, watched this uh, or listened to this message to this hour that you will give them grace to be who you expect them to be, to be fronts for you indeed on earth, spreading righteousness everywhere, making you happy as you humiliate the devil. And that uh, everything is a challenge to us, Father. I ask that speedily you will meet it in demonstration of your love to humanity. Thank you, blessed Father. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' mighty name that we are prayed. God bless you. We'll be meeting again for the third uh, segment of the teaching on the purpose of man. We have two more uh, teachings on that before we go to other things.